Welcome everybody to this week's Village Torah Torah session with me, your host, Rabbi Drew. We are talking about this week's Torah portion of Tazria. This is, uh, we are still very much in the book of Leviticus as will become very apparent uh, very quickly. So we're, I wanted to talk about uh, birth, childbirth. So that's actually the good part. And I think the more relatable part, I just want to take a step back. This week's Torah portion, it does start with talking about childbirth and more specifically impurity that relates to childbirth, but it also goes into stuff that I think we don't really connect with as closely. Uh, I'm not going to go into it right now. I talked a little bit more about it last year in the, this week in this, this space, which was uh, as far as it's not really clear what it is um, sort of white splotches, it's interesting by the time the 19th century rolls around, people are trying to categorize it in, in, in sort of medical terms. I'm going to set that aside, but I do want to, um, hopefully, you know, we can just dive right in. I want to talk about uh, what's going on here at the outset of this week's tour portion. So I'm going to start off just by reading it and we'll take it from there. So we have here really at the outset of this week's tour portion, Leviticus 12, the Lord spoke to, uh, spoke to Moses saying, speak to the Israelites saying, should a woman quicken with seed and bear a male, she shall be unclean seven days, as in the days of her menstrual unwellness, she shall be unclean. On the eighth day, the flesh of his foreskin shall be circumcised, and 30 days and three, so 33 days, she shall stay in her blood purity, or um, it's a strange uh, in her really purity bloods. Uh, purity bloods, she shall touch no consecrated thing, nor shall she come into the sanctuary until the days of her purity are completed. And if she bears a female, she shall be unclean two weeks as in her menstruation and 66 days, she shall stay over her uh, pure bloods. And when, so this already is maybe other people out there are listening to this. This is strange. This is literally a doubling. So she has seven and 33 days for a male. If she gives birth to a baby boy, seven days, she's impure, just as uh, we're going to see actually in Leviticus 15 and her uh, menstrual impurity days. And then a further 33 days in which she's sort of in this, like she's still going to be bleeding, but it's going to be sort of technically pure blood. But for a female, everything is doubled. It's a, instead mm -hmm. of seven, 14 days of, of impurity and then not 33, but 66. So really we're talking about for a male, ultimately there's going to be 40 days of these, of this bleeding and for a girl 80. So that's uh, it's a huge difference. That's a long time. Okay. And we're going to, I'm definitely going to get into this. And when the days of her purity are completed, whether for a son or for a daughter, she shall bring a yearling lamb for a burnt offering and a young pigeon or a turtle dove for an offense offering to the entrance of the tent of meeting to the priest. And he shall bring it be forward before the Lord and atone for her, and she shall be clean from the flow of her blood. This is the teaching about the childbearing woman, whether of a male or of a female. And if her hand cannot manage enough for a sheep, she shall take two turtle doves or two young pigeons, one for a burnt offering and one for an offense offering. And the priest shall atone for her and she shall be clean. Now this is, there's a lot to unpack here. Uh, not the least of which uh, I'm, I'm super fascinated. And this is definitely something we can uh, look into for next year. Why this, this sort of gradation, we don't typically have this. Usually if an offering is specified to be X, it is X, but here it's, it's X, unless you can't afford that, then Y. Um, it's an interesting move to offer a different, uh, you know, for people in, financial uh, challenges, then they have a, a lower set of offering, which is really fascinating. But that's not really what I wanted to focus on this week. Actually, I wanted to focus on really the bulk of what we see here, which is really, uh, if nothing else, look, I, I think anybody, any woman who goes through childbirth, there's going to be some bleeding that happens. There's going to be blood. Um, I but I think perhaps the biggest question, well, one question I don't know that we're going to get to today, but one question that is certainly of quite fascinating and, and interest is why, uh, why there's this sort of separate time of, of clean bloods. She's still bleeding, um, but a 
massive question for all of us is what's with this gender differentiation or perhaps more accurately sex differentiation. I don't know that the, the baby boy or baby girl knows or, or identifies as such, but certainly they're a male or a female. Now, um, there, okay. So th- this person, there's someone, uh, Rabbi Alex Kress here, who has assembled a really fascinating set of sources of more contemporary scholarship. I often in this space here at Village Torah usually look at medieval Jewish medieval biblical commentators. That is really insightful for us. But I think it's uh, what this person has done, this Rabbi Alex Kress here has done is assembled a more contemporary scholarship. And I'm excited to uh, look at a different time period uh, for our consideration here. So one of these is Robert Alter, 20th century biblical scholar. He, she shall be unclean. And this is what he says. The notion that the blood of childbirth rendered the parturient, and a parturient is really just a fancy word for a woman who has given childbirth. So that is a parturient. Ritually impure was widespread in the ancient world, reflected in texts by the Hittites to the north of Israel and by the Greeks to the west. Jacob Milgram, who was a, a a famous 20th century biblical scholar notes that the ancients believed there was seed in the blood discharged by the childbearing woman. And so he proposes that this loss of blood was associated with death and hence conveyed impurity. There, I will say there's often a sense, usually when there's death, there's a sense of impurity. So here, even though there's birth, which is great, but there's also a loss of blood, which is uh, seems to convey impurity. Now, this, as in the days of her menstrual unwellness and menstrual impurity, the um, okay, what is at issue is not the number of days, but the nature of the condition of impurity. Okay, so now this 30 days, she shall stay in her, actually 33 days, she shall stay in her blood purity. The Hebrew emphasizing the counting says literally in 30 days and three days. When one adds the initial seven days, the total period during which the woman is to avoid contact with consecrated things and also evidently refrained from marital relations, is the formulaic figure of 40 days. The blood of the first seven days is considered impure. Afterward, her blood is deemed pure, her blood purity. But she must remain in the state for 33 days before she is free of the impurity contracted at childbirth. 40 days, we've seen 40 days used elsewhere in the Bible. This is not the exclusive appearance of 40, even though uh, I don't know offhand, this is a really good trivia, uh, Torah trivia, question of how often do we see the figure of 33 days? I I don't know offhand, but certainly 40 is a figure, a number we have seen elsewhere. It's something um, that's no stranger to the Bible. So that's really interesting here. If she bears a female 60 days and six, so 66 days, she shall stay. When one adds this number to the initial 40 days, the total period of sequestration comes to 80 or twice 40. No entirely satisfactory explanation has been offered for why a female child requires twice the length of time for the mother to be a free of impurity, though one suspects the general predisposition of the culture to see the female as a potential source of impurity. Now, I'm going to take a step back here because this is really fascinating. I, just as I am quite uh, befuddled, uh, uh, curious as to why there is this doubling, this this uh, sex differentiation between a male child and a female child. It's fascinating here that Alter here, Professor Alter, wrote that no entirely satisfactory explanation. Nevertheless, he's he's certainly trying. So he says uh, maybe it's of the culture of the time, right? That uh, the female is a potential source of impurity. Interesting. Seminal omission also imparts ritual impurity, but the period for ridding oneself of the impurity imparted by menstrual discharge is much longer. So, and what he is referencing here is actually something that we will see in Leviticus 15. So it hasn't actually occurred yet here in Leviticus. Now, this offense offering the present case is a strategic instance of why it is misleading to render the Hebrew chatat, as almost all English versions do, as sin offering. Oh, this is interesting. It's something actually we discussed, I believe, a couple of weeks ago, not necessarily to translate chatat as necessarily a sin offering, but maybe an expiation or somehow a cleansing, which is, uh, I don't know where exactly this translation is from, but I certainly agree with Professor Alter. It's not really as a sin offering. 
Uh, Surely the childbearing woman has done nothing that can be called a sin. The state of ritual impurity, however imposed on her by biological circumstances, makes her a potential source of violation of the sancta, which would be an offense to the cult and to its divine object. And so she is enjoined to present an offense offering. Again, I don't like the word offense offering. That will mark the completion of her period of purification. The professor also here continues, and he says uh, the flow of her blood, the literal sense of the Hebrew is the source of her blood, the idiom exhibiting a common linguistic pattern in which there's an interchange between cause and effect. Okay. Um, okay, the hand. All right. So now that's one scholar. That's Professor Alter. Now here's another scholar, uh, Baruch Levine. And he writes, the provisions of chapter 12 have long been a subject of intense discussion by modern scholars. It's certainly, I know for us, for me, hopefully for you, it's certainly a curious chapter. He says it's long been a subject of intense discussion. Okay. It is difficult to explain why a new mother, after the awaited event of childbirth, should be considered impure, especially for such extended periods of time. There's also sex differentiation, whereby the birth of a male child obligates the mother to a less extended period of impurity than does the birth of a female. Recent insights into the meaning of ritual make it possible to place the provisions of chapter 12 in proper perspective. The rituals prescribed in the Torah regularly utilize the category of impurity for dealing with conditions that are life-threatening. In ancient usage, pure and impure correspond in to what in modern healthcare would be referred to as immune and susceptible respectively. So uh, this is fascinating for me. I don't think I've heard this before. He continues. Although the new mother was a source of joy to the community and her new child, a blessing, she generated anxiety as did all aspects of fertility and reproduction in ancient society. The childbearing mother was particularly vulnerable and her child was in danger too. Since Infant mortality was widespread in pre-modern societies. By declaring the new mother impure, susceptible, the community sought to protect and shelter her. In ancient times, concern for the welfare of the mother and child was most often expressed as the fear of destructive demonic or anti-life forces. This fear is evident in other ancient Near Eastern texts contemporaneous with the biblical period. They are replete with incantations and spells against demons and witches who are thought to kill newborn children and afflict their mothers. It is reasonable to assume that similar anxieties were current among the ancient Israelites as well. And although biblical religion certainly did not permit magical spells and the like as the proper means for overcoming these perceived threats to life, it did provide ritual means as well as practical methods to accomplish for the Israelite mother and her community what magic was supposed to accomplish for a pagan mother. Thus, chapter 12 presents a seemingly paradoxical situation, new life, but also a new threat to life. Going beyond the protection of mother and child, the legislation also aimed at safeguarding the purity of the sanctuary and the surrounding community from defilement. To this end, the new mother was barred from the sanctuary and from contact with sacred things out of the apprehension that the anti-life forces, which prey upon the newborn and the mother in her state of vulnerability, would be carried with her into the sanctuary. That, in turn, would cause divine displeasure in the same way that it was roused by any other carrier of impurity. In this connection, it is interesting to note the comment of the Sifra. I will say the Sifra is an early rabbinic, probably about a second century. Uh, uh, it's a midrash, but it's it's more than just a sort of narrative expansion, but it's, it's, a, it's an early rabbinic text. Okay. When a woman at childbirth bears a male. What are you to conclude from this verse? Since it is stated, you shall put the Israelites on guard against their impurity, lest they die through their impurity by defiling my tabernacle, which is among them. I understand that the tabernacle might be defiled not only from the inside, but also by contact with its outer side. You are to learn, therefore, she shall not enter the sanctuary. Only through actual entry into the sanctuary does one defile it. So, and then what uh, he, what he continues, he says, although the statement seeks to limit the effects of the law, the law, it expresses an awareness on the part of the rabbis that defilement involved a risk of death, death through divine wrath. The God of Israel provoked by the proximity of impurity punishes the community as a result. This interpretation may provide a clue to the systematic distinction drawn between male children and female children. Ramban, Nachmanides, tried to rationalize this distinction by referring to notions current in his day about bodily admissions. He insisted that the birth of a female caused a mother to sustain discharges for a longer period of time. It is more likely that the doubling of the initial period of impurity and the waiting period for a female had a different basis. It may have reflected apprehension and anticipation regarding the infant daughter's potential fertility. 
the expectation that she herself would someday become a new mother. Now that's a really um, interesting. So what Levine continues, he says, the regulations governing a new mother may also represent a strong response to the emphasis on fertility in ancient Near Eastern polytheism. By contrast, there could be no place in the Israelite sanctuary for the celebration of birth because such would promote a mythological attitude toward God himself. We know from the literature of other ancient Near Eastern societies that within the pagan temples, birth dramas were enacted and myths of birth were recited. Okay, this is totally new to me. Both dramatized the birth of gods and goddesses and their sexual union in celebrations that expressed the human drive for fertility. The biblical restrictions, which excluded the new mother from religious life until she and her child had survived childbirth, created a distance between the event of birth and the worship of God. For God rules over nature and grants the blessing of new life, but he is not, of course, subject to the natural processes of procreation. So from these uh, these few biblical scholars, 20th century biblical scholars, certainly some interesting perspectives. And certainly, I think really more broadly speaking, what is taking place is all of this seems so incredibly exotic right? This is not, this in some way does not comport with the way we see the world. And obviously there's a lot in Leviticus that, and certainly in the chapters to come, not only in this week's Torah portion, next week's Torah portion as well, it seems very foreign to our experiences, especially when we start talking about uh, various, uh, I'm going to say lesions or other discolorations on our skin or on our clothes or in our houses. A lot of this this week and next week's Torah portion definitely seem quite foreign to us. But fascinatingly, what this week's Torah portion does start off with talking about is is childbirth here, what we have. And I think it sounds so close to us, and yet the notions of purity and impurity, or even impure blood versus pure blood, is quite a curious conception to us. And having these uh, more contemporary, these 20th century biblical scholars trying to provide a sense of, of contextualization, uh, trying to think about contemporaneous uh, societies contemporaneous with what's going on uh, for our ancestors in the ancient Near East. What is going on? How do we make sense of this? Uh, per, whether it's this notion of vulnerability or uh, susceptibility, really fascinating. And also thinking about um, you know, one thing that I was thinking about, and, and I don't know how much, uh, at the time it was really on people's minds, but certainly even just giving space to uh, a new mother. I, I don't know if any of you have experienced this, certainly whether you yourselves or kids or grandkids when giving birth, how much, uh, sort of just some space, right. Uh, just needing there can be, especially with a, a new baby, a lot of attention uh, being thrown one way, one's way, but also thinking about the need for one's body to recover after such a, an, an event. I, I want to say almost a, it's a trauma to the body to give birth, but certainly at the very least uh, to, to make some space for the woman who's just now given birth, whether, and it's not just a week, clearly weeks ahead, uh, whether 40 or 80 days to recover, to get her um her, you know, to get a sense of getting back to, uh, even if it's not enough, but at least it's a start just to give her some space, uh, as well. So, uh, just some thoughts. All right, Debbie, have you read the book, the red tent? I have not. I've definitely heard of it and seen it. It's by Anita diamond, right? Yes. Yes. Have you, what, uh, what have you? Yes. Several times. Yeah. How is it? And it, oh, it's excellent. Yeah. It goes through the entire process and gives credence to what the Torah has said. Mm. It's yeah. very, very good. Yeah. What did you like about the book? The, um, the uh, relationship, many relationships between the older women mm -hmm. and the middle-aged women. Mm -hmm and the young women and how the ritual of birth is um, valued and um, how the process all works. Mm. And men are not um, 
And it is, I guess they had what they call the red tent. Mm -hmm. Red meaning blood. Yeah. And um, the ritual behind it and how the body works to uh, be able to give birth and the way the women, the older women, would come together to help the young girl Mm. give birth. And it's truly known that when you have many women together, they all cycle at the same time, Mm -hmm. maybe five days Mm -hmm. uh, apart, but it's very close. And it is very parallel to what you've just read about. Oh, great. It's very interesting. And it would be something that would give light uh, to the process Mm -hmm. that would give light to the understanding of what we're going to be talking about the next two weeks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, from what I've heard, the red tent is, is, is almost so sort of a contemporary midrash. It, it really breathes life into, it's not just sort of this legislation, this divine legislation, but how these things were put into practice and how people's lives uh, were around it. So that's that's correct. Yeah. Yep. It was, it's really, really good. Oh, great. Wonderful. Well, thank you for the heads up on, on that. Uh Okay. You're more than welcome. And thank you for your explanation. I enjoyed it. Thank you. And thank you for, uh, thank you for joining. Thank you for joining. Oh, I enjoyed it. I really did. Great. I try to do it very consciously. Wonderful. Thank you everybody so much for tuning in, for watching. And before we go, I just want to acknowledge and thank Jewish home of Cincinnati All Jewish programs and life here at Cedar Village are due to the moral and financial support of Jewish Home of Cincinnati. So thank you. And with that, uh, thank you so much and Shabbat Shalom.